It is Friday the 30th uh, of May 2014. Um, this is an interview for unser Politikblog and uh, Jungle Drum Radio. My name is Volker Reusing. Today I'm uh, speaking uh, with Mr. Mark Anderson of the American Free Press. We are standing um, on uh, vis a vis the Marriott Hotel in uh, Denmark, where um, currently the um, Bilderberg Conference is happening. Uh, Mr. Anderson, how long are you following Bilderberg? This is my fifth year covering Bilderberg, having started with the original Bilderberg Hound of American Free Press, Jim Tucker. And last year was my first meeting without him. That was in Watford, England. He had passed away, God rest his soul, just before that. But my second one on my own, my fifth year overall, covering Bilderberg. Um, what are your main findings about Bilderberg? Well, mainly that it's part of a network of other groups, the Atlantic Council, the Trilateral Commission. It's perhaps the most exclusive and the hardest to get into, I suppose. Uh, it's, it's, it's one frat house that's not easy to be a member of. But, uh, you know, it's basically private governance. It's the idea that, that corporations and banks are the new constituency, that they're, they're the electors, they're the voters, that it's only their welfare and, and things like that that count. And that you know they really have the 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 personhood, the stake in society. Individual people are just cogs in the wheel because we're to be the debt payers. We're to, we're the ones that pay the interest on the debts in the debt-based money system, which is their central lever of control. So Bilderberg is the most exclusive of this network, and it's been going on now. This is the 62nd year in 60 years, as many of us know. Their third time in Denmark. They haven't been here since 1969. But it's a very critical time due to the Eurosceptic elections, a lot of populist parties that don't like central rule in Brussels, they're anti-EU, and that's got to give something of a black eye to Bilderberg. So that's no doubt being discussed here in Copenhagen 2014, among other things. Do you have an idea who might be uh, particularly powerful within Bilderberg? Well, certainly the old crowd, the steering committee, and those that have been here for a number of years, even generations. David Rockefeller, although I think maybe he's too ill of health now. Um, then you have the Henry Kissingers of the world. You had Donald Graham here for many years who owned the Washington Post Company. He just surrendered that. That was sold to Jeff Bezos of Amazon. And Jeff, I believe I spotted him here, unconfirmed, even as early as Monday, May 26th, three days before the first day of Bilderberg for 2014. So you have the new guard replacing the old guard in old press organs like the Washington Post. So it becomes almost a transgenerational thing, not by family, but by money, by class, by distinction. And so you have a lot of that, you know, uh, the, the same media are here almost every year, your Financial Times people, people from The Economist, and the same think tanks that have been around for a long time, the Brookings Institution. So it's, it's almost more like the institutions maintain a presence here, regardless of who's representing them. Uh, that's, and and that goes on for many years. It seems to me that it's rather a place of coordination between uh, different uh, powers, um, um, different banks, uh, media corporations and think tanks, and um, rather a place of coordination than, a, than a, um, a not something at the top of the pyramid. Well, I think it's multifaceted. Michael Meacher, a British MP, said last year in Watford on the grounds of Bilderberg and in the Parliament later, many have seen his uh, Parliament speech to um, uh, Kenneth Clark when he was challenging him on Bilderberg right there, and it's been on YouTube and all over the place. And Meacher talked about there being deal-making here on one level, that they all come here to get the best deals they can for their respective companies. But right away you run into problems. If you're a corporate or bank owner and you come here and you're talking to a government official, then you're seeking special regulatory or tax favor. What other kind of deal are you going to get from the government, right? Maybe pass regulations that would destroy your competition but keep you in power, keep your company strong. And so right away you run into problems precisely because of the fact that you have governmental decision making colliding with corporate interests. I mean, you cannot help even under the best conditions of having a real strong potential for a conflict of interest. And I know what they say, we don't make any decisions, no resolutions are proposed or passed, but they, as I've said, they don't have to be. They can just reach a general consensus. The members go back to their respective areas of influence and they carry out the general 
planning and structure that they want. You know, the oil barons getting the price they want, the bankers getting the arrangements and interest rates and austerity measures they want. And, you know, but the conflicts and potential conflicts just pile up no matter which way you look at it. Uh, this time seems uh, to be um, important uh, regarding geostrategics. They are talking about Ukraine, and Mr. Rasmussen is here, also the Sarkeur, the highest uh, um, NATO soldier for Europe. Oh, that's, that's a big thing you mentioned. Um, the NATO thing with regards to uh, Putin uh, making an incursion into Crimea, um, no doubt they're wondering about NATO keeping its hegemony, its dominance, because NATO has been wanting to expand eastward. They, NATO just honored its eastward expansions, and the EU celebrates all the time its acquisition of new nations under its umbrella. So the EU and NATO go hand in hand, wanting to acquire, I think it's fair to say, annex, in a way, other nations, even while blaming Putin simply for protecting what he says are Russian interests in Crimea. And now who's doing the killing? Anti-Russian, apparently anti-Russian, pro-Kiev, pro-Western military forces are killing innocents in Donetsk and other parts of eastern Ukraine. This is no doubt being discussed in there, just, just as no doubt for 2014 they're discussing all these populist elections that are electing people that are anti-EU, anti-Brussels, anti-centralization. So Bilderberg's getting something of a black eye, although they recover quickly. You know, they're resilient, apparently. So, yeah, these are all megatrends that they're no doubt talking about. Um, something which makes me quite curious uh, is there are three people from China and some of the think tanks which are here are, I, it seems to me at least um, well, they are mistrusting China no less than they are mistrusting Russia and then there are three uh, people from China two scientists and one even one minister if I got it right uh, for 2014 you're saying they're here now I had heard that and I, I need to confirm it uh, well The Brookings Institution, the very influential U.S.-based uh, think tank, uh, does a lot of the heavy lifting intellectually to come up with things that are pro-Bilderberg. The idea of a United States of Europe, the idea of one standing army that's separate from NATO for all of Europe, the idea of a European Central Bank that's stronger like the Federal Reserve, the idea of a fiscal union where all the EU member nations, whether they're part of the Eurozone or not, would surrender their taxing and budgeting and the, that national function traditionally would go to Brussels. <clears throat> But, you know, they They want the EU-US trade deal, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which Brookings talked about before Trilateral and Bilderberg talked about it. Trilateral Commission being the brethren of Bilderberg. And so uh, there, there is a Chinese, I believe Chinese, you know, in his, in his extraction uh, representative who's been to Bilderberg many times. But th the question is, on their other trade deal, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, so far they've been wanting to leave China out of that even though that's the biggest free trade deal in the history of mankind, if it's ever engineered, if it's ever finished. And they don't want China in so far, so Russia starts making energy deals with China. That, that begins to form this front against the EU. And then the Eurasian Union they're talking about on the news, that's also uh, a counter to the EU. <clears throat> And so you have all these things, all these pieces on the chessboard popping up. And it's getting very interesting. It could, it could get very tense. What's going on in Ukraine could, they're trying, I, I think they're trying to egg Russia into defending U Eastern Ukrainians and start a war that then would justify NATO stepping in and give NATO another reason to advance its, he its hegemony. But without going into extravagant detail, uh, you know, China could be left out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Meanwhile, they're trying to get Japan in to the Trans-Pacific Partnership and expand that eastward and just kind of surround Russia, whatever Russia Whatever their intentions, good, bad, or indifferent, whatever one may think of Vladimir Putin, this is this is how the chess pieces are being moved. Um, um, it seems to me that uh, the place where Bilderberg is meeting uh, sometimes has a symbolic meaning. Um, for example, that um, could be. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, if you look, uh, the Bilderberg has met at Greece, and the crisis has uh, shown up at Greece. Uh, then they have met at Spain, and uh, they, I think they have met at Ireland. Maybe some of them is uh, this is random, but um, what did you think about this? Well, yeah, wherever they wipe their feet, the stains never come out, right? It it uh, it does seem, and 
correlation doesn't always mean causation, that's a rule of journalism, but it does seem wherever they've been, the freedoms go down the tank. I just heard from a reasonably reliable source, i got to confirm it, that in the recent Danish votes that sent some of these populist politicians into office, that Dan Denmark may have surrendered its right to, to uh, run its own patent laws for patenting products, you know, like the patent office in the United States. If I understand it right, the voters inadvertently or were tricked into it to whatever surrendered their patent laws to control over their patent here in Denmark. Mm -hmm. So that that's very curious. Uh, if that's the case, that would time that would have been right before Bilderberg met here that Denmark sur surrendered its patent laws. Mm -hmm. And then Spain, they met there in 2010. Now Spain is descending into more economic chaos. They've cut down on free speech almost to the bone. Even small assemblies are being broken up in Spain. And it does seem like wherever Bilderberg goes, you know, that that country ends up worse off. And and I could name other examples, that, but that's just two that come to mind right away. Uh, do you know examples of um, people who have been, uh, who have, uh, been invited to Bilderberg and then when they uh, have come back, um, picked up issues from Bilderberg? Well, I, you know, that's always a tough one because, again, it's hard to know with utter certainty that they go to Bilderberg and that they, they get a promotion or they come up with an idea that you can tangibly trace to Bilderberg. You know, you have John Kerry, the U.S. Senator from Massachusetts at the time, entering the Bilderberg meeting in 2012 in Chantilly, Virginia, where they've been before that. And he comes out and not long after that he becomes U.S. Secretary of State. And now he is one of the lead players at the Trilateral Commission. My inside sources told me he was at the Trilateral Commission just in this past April, late April of 2014, they snuck him in there and he spoke to that group. Then he went public and spoke to the Atlantic Council, another part of the Bilderberg Network, and said, uh, Vladimir Putin is uh, almost a new Hitler. We've got to counter this Russian bear. The Cold War is practically returning. Don't you feel the chill? And all these things, and they released a paper at the Trilateral Commission called Containing Russia that they, they have now posted online. Um, but my intel told me that they had Russia in their sights, and that was coming up to Bilderberg. So trace the line. Kerry goes to Bilderberg 2012, comes out Secretary of State, becomes starts agitating against Russia, speaks to the Trilateral Commission, talks about containing and opposing Russia, and speaking in very incendiary terms, almost like war, and now look where we're at. So, again, you can't connect every dot with a thick line, but you can sure make some reasonably certain extrapolations from that. Maybe you're off a little, but you, you know, you're on the right track. Um, have you um, ever had someone speaking up about Bilderberg who has been there? I think there has a chatroom house rule that they do, are not allowed to say who has said uh, of what's there, but I think they probably are allowed to report something. In my somewhat limited experience, although it's been very intense study and discussion and writing, um, they, what happens is they'll, they'll float an idea that came from here, but they won't say it came from here. I think the Chatham House rule simply says, you know, just don't, don't leave here and talk and say that you got this idea or this policy idea and say you got it here. You know, they, they might float an idea, wait a little while till things cool down, but they, they're, they're forbidden to say what was said here or to attribute the idea to here. I think as long as they don't make that link, I think they're okay. You know, and they may not all, let's be, let's be honest, they may not all go in there and agree with each other and everything. There may be dissidents in there, maybe the Dutch p politician that addressed people that came out of the Bilderberg meeting as a participant and talked to some of the activists today here, May 30th, 2014. Maybe he's, maybe he'll have misgivings. I, I don't think they're all necessarily rogues and uh, mountebanks and matoids, you know, but you make a deal with the devil and, and you know, even the best of people can get compromised. Um, I would like to learn a bit about your newspaper, the American Free Press. Oh, sure, absolutely. Uh, it's existed since 2001. These are some recent headlines I wrote. Front page, Bilderberg meeting. Uh, site confirmed and Bilderberg Probe, a very important article I believe. These are at AmericanFreePress.net 
where you can inquire about an online version or the hard copy. That's my cheap plug here. And it's existed since 2001 um, when the spotlight had to close. American Free Press rose in its place. And Jim Tucker, my predecessor for Bilderberg, was already covering Bilderberg for the spotlight from the 1970s up till 2001, and then it carried over into American Free Press. And then as he went along, he handed the baton to me uh, a little bit at a time, and then now that's where I'm at. But it's a national weekly based in D.C. It's pretty hard hitting. We get a lot of criticism, but we win a lot of friends too. If you're going to report things as truthfully as you can, uh, for every friend you make, you're going to make an enemy, typically. But I think people come around especially when they realize that the dominant corporate mainstream media shouldn't be mainstream and is in fact misleading people t much too often. Many things. Yeah, well thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. The sun.